Alicia Lola Jones of Indiana University, uh, who is going to be presenting um, Church Realness, the performance of discretionary devices and deliverance. Church and uh, the Academy, 
I wish to avoid being inspired by the stereotypical notions of black church culture as pathological or of black men as always deceptive and or on the down low. I want to emphasize that black Christianity is diverse and complex as are other spiritual traditions. I also see this project as an empowering opportunity to offer a more nuanced representation of black Christian men and their music making. And it is empowering for me as a black female scholar who is sympathetic to womanist and black feminist issues. Actually, Dr. Ramsey's use of Karen Clark Sheard in many ways serves as a, a segue to what I want to discuss with the remainder of my talk. Just this week, the Church of God in Christ hereafter referred to as Kojic it um, convened its largest uh, convocation. Um, and it is the largest black Pentecostal organization in the United States. And this year would be its 108th holy convocation, um, which includes worship services, concerts, and workshops. And many of the acclaimed gospel musicians, such as Karen Clark Shear, the Wines, Kim Burrell, and Pastor Diane Clarkin were raised in the Kojic tradition. In fact, um, Pastor Diane McCarthy's music performances and sermons exemplify tensions surrounding the role that musicians' identity play in um, facilitating African-American gospel performance um, that are uh, issues that are central to my research interests. He is a self-identified um, delivered homosexual singer, songwriter, and executive producer of BET's gospel competition, Sunday Best. Since his testified deliverance from homosexuality in the early 2000s, Pastor McCurkin has been outspoken about young men and women being disproportionately turned out or introduced to homosexuality in the church. He believes that youths are drawn to quote-unquote perverted sexual exploration at church-sponsored musical events like the Kojic Holy Congregation. Mm. I commenced ethnography on Donnie McClurkin's locality when he was a featured minister at a revival um, at St. Sabina Catholic Church in Chicago, Illinois in January 2014. And I evaluated several texts, such as his music, interviews, memoir, um, performance footage, and participants in public and private uh, sociocultural scripts of communication. I noticed his striking performance of heteropatriarchal language and his message of deliverance from homosexuality and traced his style to the Kojic teachings that em emphasize deliverance from queer gender expression and sexual orientation. Then I closely examined the 102nd Holy Convocation some years back in Memphis, which was um, 2012, when uh, Pastor Donnie McCarthy admitted in a sermon that he was entrenched in contemporary gay gospel music networks as a self-identified forefather. So first, I would like to um, musically orient you to uh, uh, his sound as a vocalist, and then I would like to show you a little bit of his um, sermon at that convocation. So here's a song you may be familiar with, We Fall Down, um, from, uh, by Don McClurkin. <laughs> Um, and here is uh, a clip from that uh, 
sermon that uh, sent ripples throughout um, uh, various gospel communities. maintains the gay social knowledge, maneuvers, and performance 
that heteropatriarchal gospel music patrons may not detect. Mm. Within his style of exhorting the youth, Pastor McClurkin reads the gay and lesbian believers in the event as embodying a spiritual problem. Read is a popular black gay vernacular for finding a flaw in someone or thing, often in a performative manner. McClurkin preaches that gay sexual orientation is not God's ideal or natural, and thus being gay is not a legitimate identity. Adapting what registered to many, uh, many as gay vernacular and posture, though, McClurkin chastises them about what they already know about themselves. He uses several signifiers that invoke black gay ball culture, um, such as, um, uh, he uses several terms as signifiers to invoke black gay ball culture, such as house, forefather, turned out, children, kids, and real. I'm struck in particular by Pastor McClurkin's rejection of the notion that a person's self-identification as gay is real. During the Holy Convocation Midnight musicals, for example, McClurkin observed the youth's interactions in, uh, and in his sermon, he suggested that he saw two performances of realness that signify both a heterosexual and a gay um, connotation. Uh, to the heterosexual believer, uh, real may refer to one being authentic. And to the gay believer and their allies, real may also refer to one engaging in identity code switching. His evocation of real was a missile, missile of critique loaded with transgressive black gay meaning. McClurkin reads the youth in a manner that resembles the black gay connotation of the term realness that is um, uh, a central figure, a central component of uh, black gay nightlife. Writing in 2013, gender studies scholar Marlon Bailey explains that realness as a, quick, a theory of quotidian performance offers a way to understand primarily how in society, beyond the ballroom scene, all gender and sexuality, sexual identities are performed. I describe gay and as gay men's performance of gender and sexuality um, as that which aligns with heteropatriarchal ideologies, um, and I term it as church realness signifying on an actual performance category within black gay ball culture. Church realness also accounts for men's engagement with the public's imagination to diffuse rumor and maintain their sense of belonging, belonging in the religious community. Let me might be uh, over. a little bit over here. Okay, in closing, <laughs> <laughs> I'll use this particular case study in the longer project to argue that some deliberate homosexual and gay men, some deliberate homosexual and gay men manage potential social dissonance by deploying discretionary devices that distance them from perceived queerness. On the one hand, these discretionary devices are empowering for men and that they are tools for privately engaging one another in public. On the other hand, discretionary devices are disempowering for those who are left out of what Richard, Richard Schechner would call a form of dark play. That is, quote, playing in the dark means that some of the players don't know they are playing. Dark play rewards its players by means of deceit and disruption and excess. Dark play can be done entirely in private, known only to the player. Through my ethnomusicological research, I offer new ways of analyzing men's gender and sexuality as each aspect of their identity is discreetly performed in a manner that each of the religious and social communities recognize. I look forward to further conversation during the question and answer. so great to hear your work and uh, to hear that song and, and all that. I, I happened to be in St. Louis last weekend for How the convocation. Was it? Yeah, it was, Bless your ministry. Yeah, it was, uh, there were a lot of white dresses downtown. Oh, <laughs> wow. St. Louis last weekend. 
And I happened to, by the way, uh, that was in a session with uh, one of the drummers in the hmm. uh, in the the uh, the convocation who left to do the, the to do a session, and um, this drummer happened to have been um, sat down. Yeah. Mm. Where you had to attend but couldn't play because of some something going on that perceived going on in his personal life. You right. know? So we, you know, so I know very well this this whole business of public shaming and discipline. Mm. My uh, question to you is uh, is this um, since we're you know talking about philosophies and uh, this idea of realness I'm really interested in. Uh, I saw you use it three ways. Mm -hmm. Two, uh, one of the ways you may not have realized. It. Okay. Okay. One was in the this uh, realness in the gender, mm -hmm. you know, gender performance, mm -hmm. right? The, and then the other was uh, in this the doctrinal uh, yeah. pronouncements of this particular de denomination. Mm -hmm. The other one is what I see as the doctrine doctrine of disciplines, and mm -hmm. because you 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 introduced yourself as the ethnomusicologist mm -hmm. on the, uh, mm -hmm. the thing. And this mm -hmm. is something I notice that ethnomusicologists do a lot. <laughs> there's this, you know, there's a, it's almost doctrinal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and I don't know whether that's historic or it has to do with how the disciplines were formed or whatever. But I'm wondering, have, can you kind of riff a little bit about this triangulation that occurred in, in the talk of, you know, we're, we're talking about performances after, after all, right. you know, right. you know, scripts, let's say, right. you know, receive scripts that we can either receive and reproduce or push against. Right. So you want to just yeah. kick it around sure. a little bit. Yeah. Sure. I mean, we love to position ourselves as ethnomusicologists and kind of orient folks um, to the tools that we use, which is why I said um, something to the effect of the texts that I um, examined mm -hmm. were um, his music footage, interviews with him, his memoir. Um, and, and so um, I, I think the, the richness of what we are able to, to look at informs um, um, a sort of analysis where the music stops. And that becomes something that we can look at apart from um, uh, uh, relying on the written tradition. So um, performance practice then um, is illustrated when folks like me who see him stop the music, I understand as a musician that a part of what he's doing is also trying to verify his performance competence as a worship leader and minister. Um, and so as an ethnomusicologist, that sort of understanding of silences mm -hmm. um, through personal narrative, being performed through personal narrative mm -hmm. becomes a resource. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. More comments? I'm sort of, um, well, I'm developing like a very interesting network on this little paper here around what you're doing. It's fascinating. Let me see, but I don't have a, 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 I'm unable to trace a single line. But it seemed to me that double consciousness is a good place to start. Mm -hmm. And then you went from there to multiple consciousnesses, mm -hmm. which seems like a good place to go because, I mean, Maybe the whole paper is about double consciousnesses, but you are translating into the mode of discretionary devices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. That, that sits for what you do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so someone says, deliver it, but still gay. That was my, that was my uh, little yellow point there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that how that's going? So, um, folks like, those who are, openly and unapologetically gay um, within gospel networks um, uh, often have gone on the record saying that um, his self-identification as um, delivered homosexual, delivered gay, I'm using his term when I say homosexual, um, that that is a um, symptom of uh, self-loathing. Um, and so they say that actually know what you're doing is going um, along with um, what you know your patrons want to hear. Um, and so right now, the complexity of what I'm dealing with um, as an ethnomusicologist <laughs> interviewing people is that um, <laughs> um, 
really trying to sort of, for lack of a better word, groom folks to feel comfortable to actually either give me a first person account of these sorts of tensions that is, is exemplified in Donna McClurkin's um, uh, narrative, or um, sort of talk about um, actual events that I can trace. Um, but there is um, a, a critique that folks would say with that joke that I mentioned that um, it's no coincidence um, that he released that song um, around the time he released information that he had a past as a gay man. Um, and that it becomes in many ways a PR strategy to manage people's sentiments about homosexuality within Pentecostal um, settings. And the song was, we fall down and we get up. We fall down and we get up. It's repeated over and over. Oh, yeah, that was, that was the other part. You said it in Pentecostal settings because um, I did a little work on projects because of Malachi Favors, who was the art and sound of Chicago as a member. And I counted him in going to the funeral and uh, having his nephew preach the sermon. Mm. And, uh, and he, and at some point, he said, "Well, Brother Faber did a kind of music that was not sanctioned by the Church of God in Christ." Mm -hmm. So at a certain point, he was delivered, but still he was doing an unapproved kind of music. And so that's another kind of double consciousness. But it seems to me that the other thread of the work that I look at is I remember that Kojic is not just an American movement. You know, there are people, like they say on their own website, it says 63 countries, that's what I remember, around the world. And I was wondering, do they all feel the same way about Donnie McLaurin? Or maybe do some of them not care because they have their own issues in their own countries about homosexuality and deliverance and, uh, culture and, and, and gay cultures and various kinds of LGBTQ and all this kind of thing. They have to deal with that in, in their own way. So there might be a sense in which the conversation might need to be extended to see what people in some of those other regions of the world where they do follow this. I mean, the original guy was a Mason, or was that? I mean, you know, he did. I, I don't think he. I think he thought of this as a kind of cosmopolitan movement. And huh. So, I mean, maybe he had it's something. To, he had so many fetishes in his. I mean, he was doing both. He was in magic too, by the way. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. He had. They, you know, when he died, they just found all, all kinds of stuff. Wow. <laughs> Could yeah. you tell us more? <laughs> well, well, yeah. He he had. You know, he was doing the the Pentecostal thing, but he was also very interested in these little trinkets and things like that that were associated with, uh, you know, a, a very, very ecumenical. This wasn't well known ecumenical, you know, religious practices. Wow. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, could I ask a question about that, his range? Uh-huh. Okay, he's a high tenor, right? See, so he's starting, you, yeah. you got inside of knowledge, sir. Well, <laughs> and I'm not even an ethnomusicologist. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is the late session, right? Yes, we can sir. loosen up? Yes. Okay, uh -huh. all right, so I'm, um, so if that's if that song came out at the same time, mm -hmm. if we if we could begin to build a semiotics of of queerness in gospel music, and use because if he's already said that he's a gay man and he's making music, delivered. he's delivered. Okay, then a semiotics of a delivered gay man, uh, uh, you know, which is even more provocative. Mm -hmm. Okay, this this guy's range at the end of that song mm -hmm. is just like mm -hmm. it's crazy. It's almost. Uh, a plaintive cry, and I would put mm -hmm. it in the range of melodramatic. He's mm -hmm. like, to me, one of the most melodramatic, you know, men singers in gospel. Mm -hmm. So where do you where do you situate that in terms of reading what he does uh, uh, musically? What what you know his style? Mm -hmm. Where does it fit into the you know what's to in what's available out there? Three things come to mind. Um, first, his uh, he has gone on record saying that his um, sort of Gospel tenor hero is um, Walter, the late Wal Bishop Walter Hawkins, um, whose um, narrative has a lot of discourses around yes. uh, around his identity. Um, but that's his ideal tenor, um, and he would approach the the edges of his uh, range mm -hmm. vocally. The second thing that I think of is that. Um, there was a shift in uh, Pastor McClurkin's musicality following um, um, some physical challenges 
uh, with regard to leukemia, a leukemia scare, and then um, a vocal, uh, some sort of vocal fault. I can't recall, I think it was something like an annual, uh, uh, node. node or something, and um, he lost a portion of his range. And so in many ways, the the approach to the edges of his uh, of his tenor register are signifying that um, not only has he been delivered, um, but it's also um, a signifier of healing. Um, and then, um, as um, we've discussed uh, before, um, when I uh, the third part that I think of is. When I heard him preach at um, at uh, Saint Sabina, um, following his sermon um, and his whole idea of why he preaches has been very fascinating. But I'll say that in that particular moment, he, um, after preaching for an hour and a half extemporaneously, he begins to sing, um, uh, basically um, modulating. Um, um, a duet with uh, the great Dr. Walt Whitman on the piano and singing with him. And as he, as he did it, you could hear that there was, it was strident, more and more strident. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm presently working on ideas of um, the assertion of musical dominance vocally, um, or what I call a musical top. Um, and how, as he and Dr. Uh, Whitman um, uh, engage each other vocally, it became um, quite intense. And so I spoke with the choir members afterwards just to ask impressions about the service. Uh -huh. And many of them focused in on the sort of intensity that was generated in that moment. Mm -hmm. Well, we may have to... Um, Thank you very much. That was extraordinary. I had a lot of impressions.